Acting is not divination, or it shouldn't be. It's yeah. not, I mean, it should feel magical, and sometimes it's transcendent when just everything's sort of cooking the way that it needs to be. Certainly the, the talent is involved and the, like those ephemeral things that you can't put your hand on, but it's a technique. You can be taught this art form, in my opinion. You know, I'm really lucky to have had really great training and worked with some really great actors that I've been smart enough to just shut up and learn from. But it's, it's not easy, but it's not magic either. Filmmaker Magazine presents Back to One with Peter Rinaldi. Stephanie Kurtzuba is an actor. She sat down with me in New York City to talk about the work. Do you have a typical way that you begin your process to inhabit a character? You know, I don't necessarily have a, a particular uh, price process that is tried and true that I have to do every time, but I always, step one always for me, no matter how I then proceed to prepare for the role, is reading it and reading it again and then checking myself to see what presumptions I've made and then forcing myself to get rid of those and read it again for a third time with completely devoid of any preconceived notions I had or any choices that I had made in the audition process. Mm -hmm. That's usually, I usually do that to check myself mm -hmm. so that um, I don't go into the true prep work with any sort of uh, obligation to feel like I have to do this or I have to do that. I want to usually I usually already have done that somewhere along yeah. in the audition process as you're living with the material and showing yeah. it to people to get the job. And then I try to um, challenge myself to f forget all of the things that I've decided. You know, that, that brings up something that no one has really talked about, which is those choices that you made for the audition were re had to be really strong. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and, and you knew you had to make those to show that you were confidently uh, uh, playing that character, mm -hmm. you know, and it might not have been maybe the choices that anybody in the room or anybody watching that tape or whatever wanted to have, but they appreciated your choice. So that's why you got the role. But, yeah. but they need to be gone. Like you're saying, they need to be uh, ex extracted because you've, you've read the whole script now or you've learned yeah. other things. And you and Well, and you're also discounting the the biggest part, in my opinion, of the acting experience, which is who are you acting with and what are they bringing? Oh, yeah. And, um, you know, acting is reacting, they say. So, yeah. you, you know, you are making these choices for the audition process, presupposing what's coming back at you, because generally you're not reading with another actor, you're reading with a casting director or even the director sometimes. And so you're you know, you're going off of what you've decided in your mind the other person is doing because you're not necessarily getting a performance back. You're, you're just getting a reader. Yeah. Um, so you have to recognize that, okay, now I've, I've been hired to be part of an ensemble and I'm going to have partners in this work. Yes. And I need to be open to what they're bringing because they may have decided something completely different is going to indelibly change. Hopefully, if I'm doing my job correctly, how I'm hearing it, what I'm getting from them, and how I'm going to react. When were you bitten by this bug, this acting bug? Like, can you can you can you pinpoint the? the I think time? it was. You know, I don't necessarily think I realized that it was the acting bug when it bit me. Um, I grew up like so many little girls in all over the country do. You know, doing dance recitals. And I remember not just enjoying the expression of dance. I was always that kid who gave a little bit too much, you know, <laughs> like she's a little too into it. And you're, it was either, it was probably pretty adorable yeah. before the age of like seven. And then after it got like a little irritating. But, um, <laughs> but I remember going to, I grew up in Omaha, Nebraska. And there's this gorgeous uh, sort of, Roadhouse called the Orpheum Theater. And for whatever reason, my little dance studio performed once a year in this glorious, I mean, spectacular, larger than most Broadway houses, but this beautiful old roadhouse. And we would, I would just go exploring through this theater. And there was something about that, the dressing rooms, the theater without any people in it, yeah. the, lo the empty lobby, the ornate staircase. There was just something about it that I just, I, I wanted to be there yeah. forever. Yeah. 
And I think that's where it sort of started, just the atmosphere of how I felt in that, in that atmosphere. Um, and then that combined with um, the sort of natural gravitational pull I had towards expression and storytelling. And it started out in dance, and then I quickly learned that I could speak and sing, and those were also tools to. Mm -hmm. And and when you were young and and dreamed of having a career as an actor, was it on the stage or on the screen? This is going to sound bizarre, but I've been thinking about this very question a lot recently. And what I have, what I've distilled it down to, as as truthfully as I can, is. I don't know when I was a kid, when I was thinking about having a career as an actor, I don't know that I ever thought, oh, it's on stage or it's on screen. My favorite place in the world is the rehearsal room because that's where I feel the freest. Once it's committed to the stage, it's committed to the camera, to the, to the lens, it suddenly becomes something else mm -hmm. that I'm like sort of not as much a part of anymore. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe that's not true on stage. Maybe I still am, but something about the freedom of, uh, the rehearsal room and just doing it and redoing it and doing it again and having more ideas and talking about it and doing it again. That's what my, when I sort of imagined my future as a, an actor, as an artist, that's the place my, my mind always went to. Do you still feel that way? In many ways I do, yeah. It's interesting because that is the scariest place for me. <laughs> really? Yeah, I mean, just as, on e both sides of the table. I was just I was just at a rehearsal, just observing, and I was I w I felt of uh, a f a fear uh, 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 for everyone, and I, I want to get over that. Like because I think you're right. I think that that uh, uh, if you can if you can live in that if you can live in that doing over over again, having an idea, uh -huh. doing it again, that kind of thing is is wonderful and that's really where the work can can be fostered well and i think perhaps maybe where the fear comes from i mean because i have felt the the fear in in rehearsal as well i think the fear comes from thinking that you have to have all the answers yes and and if you if you you know relieve yourself of that responsibility and just say i don't know we're figuring it out suddenly the world opens up in a way yes the, the world of the play or the world of the screenplay or whatever open up, opens itself up to you so that you can go, okay, well, I'm going to get this wrong 15 times, but those 15 times are going to lead me to the one that's the one we want to commit to, yes. you know, to film. And, and when you have this, this reverence toward uh, uh, rehearsal and some, I'm sure there's some uh, spe specifically right. film um, actors that have, you've come across uh -huh. in, your, in your career, either in TV or in movies that don't like this idea of rehearsal at all yeah do you feel do you feel a need to take that away from them and show them the benefits of of rehearsal or do you do you cave in and lean toward their way of of minimal or no rehearsal well i see as i've gotten more into the world of um screen acting because i started my career on stage which is you know it's constant rehearsal um I've come to see the value also of not rehearsing mm -hmm. because I do think particularly for for the medium of film, mm -hmm. the spontaneity um, that you can capture without rehearsal yeah, sometimes sure. is super beneficial um, in a way that over rehearsal can be detrimental. But here's what here's how I've personally handled that because often in f the world of film there is not rehearsal, particularly in television because it moves so yeah. quickly. You show up, you do the scene, you do your job. There's not a lot of time for exploration. It's you show up prepared, you commit it mm -hmm. to you know memory, and you do what you need to do. Um, but what I've found that my best defense against feeling unrehearsed when I show up for, or, or I'm working with an actor that prefers not to rehearse, is to just, I do the rehearsal on my own. Mm -hmm. I do the rehearsal as part of my prep. Mm -hmm. Now certainly I can't do it to the degree that I would be able to do it with my fellow actor if yeah. they were interested, but everyone's process is their own. Yes. And um, 
you know, and I'm, I'm old enough now in my career to respect that and know that there's not one way to skin the cat. There, yeah. I just need to be true to whatever my yes. way is and show up as prepared as possible. Yes. I also think that acting is not divination. Mm-hmm. It, it, or it shouldn't be. It's yeah. not, I mean, it should feel magical and sometimes it's transcendent when just everything's sort of cooking the way that it needs to be. But acting is certainly the, the talent is involved and the like those ephemeral things that you can't put your hand on but it's a technique you can be taught this art form in my opinion you know i'm really lucky to have had really great training and worked with some really great actors that i've been smart enough to just shut up and learn from yeah um but it's it's not easy but it's not magic either mm. And, and I've seen um, directors take somebody that was lost and totally make it make it work and brought it, brought them out into something special in, it, mm-hmm. in a moment, you know? And the best directors, in my opinion, are the ones that they don't come up and tell you what they need or what they're missing. They watch what you're doing mm. and they figure out the language. They, it's almost like they're the they're the guardrails on the on the highway. And they don't try to tell you what car to drive. Mm. They just move the guardrails where they need you to be. And if they're clever enough, you don't even realize that they're doing it. They make you go, here's a thought. And they plop the thought into your head and then you go, oh, I know. So you always are are feeling um, a part of the collaboration, like you're not being. Because I've also been manipulated into choices by directors and there's honestly no worse feeling as an actor Mm -hmm. to feel like well i'm not successful with with what i'm doing so obviously they're pushing me into something else that now it feels manufactured put on which in front of the camera in particular is death yes even though they think that they have successfully gotten you on their track Mm -hmm. you're you're still not at your best no because there's a self-consciousness about oh i wasn't doing it right yeah um and you know it's very possible I wasn't doing it right and they needed me to go somewhere else. And that's the, the director's certainly prerogative and job. But I think point in the right way and let and let your actor do their job. Yeah, yeah. And people talk about being director proof. Yes. And I think it's, I completely understand why actors talk about that. But it makes me a bit sad. Yes. Because it means that people aren't trusting each other. Yeah. You know, yes. and I understand. I've been in the position. I was once told by a director, "You are director proof," <laughs> and he th- he meant it. In, I think in both connotations, both positive and negative. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I heard him loud and clear on that one. <laughs> but I remember thinking my my initial reaction was not defensiveness. It was just sort of a sadness of like, well, I kind of had to be like this because I'm the one up there on stage, or I'm the yes. one on film, and if it doesn't go well. I'm the one with egg on my face. You kind of did that for the betterment of the piece. Yeah. It's not not yeah. not for yourself. Yeah, to, not to trying get... to circumvent anyone, just yeah. being like, you don't understand what it is to to stand up here and feel the egginess of it. It's mm. that's a that's a that's a bad place to be in. I've I've done it multiple times and it's like you never enjoy it. I'm imagining when Scorsese cast you in The Irishman, after he cast you in The Wolf of Wall Street, that's a more exciting thing than even when you were cast in The Wolf of Wall Street. Because when, it, when you were cast in The Wolf of Wall Street, it's exciting, it's a, it's a big, big thing. But he now wants you again. Yeah, it kind of makes me a little teary. Again, I'm on, I'm on theater hangover, so I might just be a little emotional today. <laughs> But no, truly, yeah, wow, yeah, to have the confidence of the, you know, one of the best filmmakers of all time to say, I choose you, Pikachu, (laughs) is, uh, I don't know if that, the resonance of that has fully, like, reverberated in my mind and in my soul as fully as it really, what it really means. Because let's, let's face it, there's, there's not a lot of female parts in this movie. No. And he could have, and there's t- tons of people that want he has whatever's a- available. He has access to the best of the yeah. best. He has, he has access and friendships and, you know, certainly any actor 
I would assume, would, would give their eye teeth yes. to work with him, let alone work with him on this, in this genre, with these actors. Yeah. I mean, the list goes on and on. And you've said, getting on the set with these guys, you were alone intimidated until the work started happening, and then you realize they're just actors. And, and that might be surprising to people that aren't actors, but I think actors aren't surprised by, by that. You know, like, yeah, these guys are just doing their work. And when, and when it's a set, the best don't have this kind of ego That's thing true. and have this. That is so accurate. And that was another uh, revelation to me because I have worked on multiple sets and there's ego is always in play. And I find that at the highest levels of the game, if, as it were, it ceases to be an issue like it is yeah. on other things. And, and I think that it's, I think it's like when you don't, they're so established, they don't have anything that they need to prove to the world. I mean, I'm sure they do personally, like we all carry those things, right? But professionally, these guys, they know what they're doing. They've been doing it for a long time. They're completely comfortable in their own skin and in their own artistry. And so why do I have to argue about who's getting more screen time or who's got more lines in the scene or yeah. where are the camera placements? None of that, all that ego-driven stuff yeah. is out the window. They're just actors trying to get the story right. Yes. Which is, I mean, right. isn't that why we do this? We're storytellers, right? Right. All of us come from different, you know, come to it differently, but yeah, that's, right. that's why we're in it. Yes. I've never heard an actor say that a Scorsese set is, you know, anything less than <laughs> conducive to good work. But, but can you just get a, a little specific? Like, this is a giant um, uh, movie and, and you have to do these scenes, just like scenes in any other thing that you would do so you in other words you have to get to the truth of the moment what does scorsese specifically do to help you get there and can you compare it to other directors why is he so good mm -hmm. as an acting director i think there is a multi-layered answer to your question it's an excellent question the the first layer sort of support that you have on a scorsese set that you have on other sets as well, but the level of artistry is just above and beyond is the physical world that you're inhabiting. The way that you look. And believe me when I say camera test upon camera test of costumes, of makeup, of hair, there's nothing is left to chance. It is all like gone through with a fine tooth comb so that the world exists precisely the way that it needs to. So uh, that's your first layer of uh, of just support from him as yes. a director stepping yes. onto set. And again, I don't think that can be understated. Um, that's really important to me in my process. I know where I am, I know who I yeah. am because of how I look. Now, I bring the internal stuff. Yes. The thing that makes Marty so um, exceptional as an actor's director, in my opinion, he trusts me. Mm. We have conversations off camera about everything from the time period, the character themselves, what information this character does or does not have in the moment. Um, and then he just trusts you mm. to create the world. And that's whenever you watch a Scorsese film, one of the, the you know, things about all of his movies they just are this rich tapestry it's it's not one story in the foreground with a bunch of busy work going on behind everything yes. is purposeful every character is purposeful every moment is purposeful and so he he weaves this rich tapestry and when you are in his world he provides you with all the information that you need to do the work that creates that, mm -hmm. the richness. And then he gets into the editing room with Thelma and they, they pluck these moments out mm -hmm. like strings, you know, mm -hmm. just to give overtones and undertones. And it just creates this, you know, mm -hmm. symphonic tapestry. And speaking of that, did, when you saw what they chose, 
was it in line with what you were going through where, where you were like, oh yeah, that was the moment that I remember I was connecting or, or were you surprised by certain things that they, that they chose? I think I w it was mostly in keeping with what I imagined. Um, it definitely, there were definitely things in, in it that were, um, if not surprising, intriguing. Oh, they went with that rather yeah. than that. And then, but then you were seeing how it worked. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but then you yeah. see the way that they put it together, right. and you're like, yeah. "Well, it oh. had to be that." Yeah, of yeah. course, right. it had to be yeah. that one. Yeah. I definitely remember having very clearly the feeling while on set, of, you know, when I when we did Wolf of Wall Street, there was so I mean there was much improv as Marty is wont to do on The Irishman, but there was even more because we had these huge group scenes that were sort of chaotic in Wolf mm -hmm. of Wall Street, and you know, improvising and finding lines that made it into the final cut of things mm -hmm. that were just thrown out. And I remember when we were doing Irishman thinking, boy, I don't, I'm not having as much of an opportunity to sort of pull out a zinger here. Yeah. And, the, and then I realized very quickly, I mean, I'm here to tell a different story. Yeah, I serve a different function in this world. And the reason that Marty trusts me to do that work, I assume, I don't want to speak for him, but I would assume is because he knows that I will do what needs to be done to stay in my lane to tell the story. Again, direction, stay in your lane. Tell the story I've set you up to tell. Mm -hmm. And and then when you see it woven together and you see the masterful way that he just, you don't necessarily are thinking about the women, you're watching the scene, and then he'll cut to one reaction shot. Suddenly you are so aware of these women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the sort of silent judgment mm -hmm. that they sit in, in the world that they are forced to occupy in this toxically masculine world, mm -hmm. in a, a generation of women that did not have a voice, that did not have the confidence or permission to weigh in on what this world was. And you go, that's not a mistake. He's not choosing not to use that dialogue that we use there because he doesn't want to he's making a, d a larger point mm -hmm. just the idea of knowing your part of the story uh is something that keeps coming up on this show over and over again the that that role of the actor of understanding the story and their place in it which i never ever until i started talking to people really thought about enough and yeah. for, for that as a skill set, as an actor, to sum up and just realize, okay, you know, it's not just about getting in the characters, knowing what this character is in this story. You yes. Know? Yeah. You're part of a bigger picture and understanding the bigger picture. Yes. You said that your character, Irene's granddaughter in real life, mm -hmm. was on the set. And you said that she was very generous to you and was giving you... She was um, remarkably kind, generous with information and details about Irene. Yeah. And did she come to you when you were already on the set or before? I found or? out that she, that her name is Brittany, that Brittany was on the film while in the hair and makeup trailer wow. one morning towards the very beginning of uh, filming. And Brittany was good friends with one of the women who was in, uh, who was in the hair department. She offhandedly mentioned it, and I, I just sort of took her aside and I said, hey, I certainly don't want to step on any toes, but do you think Brittany might be willing to have a conversation with me? And um, she put us in touch, and Brittany and I are still in touch. Like, mm -hmm. we, 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 you know, cemented a friendship over the course of this. I had a very rich and close relationship with my grandmother, mm -hmm. and she did as well with her grandmother. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of connected over that common um, mm -hmm adoration mm -hmm. of these elder women in our lives and i felt a huge responsibility to to my own this sounds weird but to my own grandmother mm -hmm. to get it right for britney Ooh. you know Ooh, that's interesting because this is a tough story i mean this is her family and this is yeah. not um i don't know that i would want to share a story yeah. like this with the world yeah. it's tough it's complicated but it seems like that kind of responsibility is not scary it's kind of gives you another thing to drive you right in in, yeah. in the work is that yeah, right? No, yeah, it really did. It kept me, kept me on my toes. It kept me really engaged. Yeah. 
you know, even more so than just being on Marty's set right. <laughs> with Bob, yeah. you know, which right. also kept me on my toes. Right. <laughs> so. and, and how how was that? Like, it, it seems like he would be a good um, um, uh, partner, respecting you as an actor. But did he have a, an extra amount of tension or or, or um, anxiety? Due to the idea of of uh, certain times having to play younger than he than he was, you know, knowing his face yeah. was going to change and stuff like that, was that was that? Would you feel anything like that? I didn't necessarily feel it around the issue of the de aging or any of that. Like he always just felt present as as Bob the actor. Mm-hmm. Um, I definitely noticed. First of all, he could not have been more welcoming and kind, generous with me. Um, just as a human being, both both in the scenes and outside of the scenes. Um, so that was a big deal for me coming into this, knowing that, you know, hi, I'm the new kid. Yeah. You know, yeah. you guys have known each other for however many yeah. years. And, yeah. and I know it could be anybody besides me, but it's me. Um, but the one thing I did notice was he and Marty, um, I don't necessarily know if it was the pressure Bob was feeling, but I, de- I, was, I did bear witness many times to like, you know, we would finish a take and Bob and Marty would sort of put their heads together, like, uh-huh. you know, almost almost forehead yeah. to forehead, really going over yeah. like, what did we get? What do we need? Mm. And I heard Bob say many times, hey, hey, Marty, hey, Marty, what if I tried uh, this mm. or, or could we do it again? And I'll try that. He was very involved mm. with, um, you know, bringing different colors to it. Let's do yeah. another take. Let me try something else. Let me. Yeah. So it's, it's really cool to hear that because it's like it's the it goes back to like the, the whole rehearsal thing yeah just trying things being in their place of just trying different things it's not like the you know even the our the greatest actor of our time perhaps is still always trying he's not going to get it right in the first maybe two or three takes or maybe he's, he did but he's just smart enough to know that whatever the story is going to hang together as later marty needs options yes you know because the idea of getting it right I think is uh, is the death of art. You just got to get something truthful. Yes. If it, if it's truthful, that's better than right. Right doesn't exist. Oh, I like that. If you had your druthers, your complete druthers, <laughs> vodka over tequila. <laughs> Wait, no. And by that I mean, no worries about money or anything. And you can, oh, I you like can do whatever game. you want. <laughs> okay. <laughs> would, would you? Would you? Would you spend the rest of your career on the stage? Mm. No. So there's something you're getting in film work that's feeding your uh, your inner actor. That's feeding your art. Mm. I'll tell you. I mean. One thing that I'm enjoying so much about film work over stage work is this. As an actor on stage, and I did this for many years and it was my first love, feeling the responsibility of having to direct the audience to the story moment to moment. That, that falls upon the actor in live theater. It's, um, you're basically acting as the editor in real time look as I touch this object over here and I speak about this Mm -hmm. relationship here and I now I'm moving to downstage where I want you to follow me with your eyes. That responsibility ceases to be yours when you are performing on camera. Mm -hmm. All I'm responsible for on camera is finding the truth of that moment. Mm -hmm. And then the editor takes it into their yeah. deft hands yeah. and shows the audience yeah. what they should be feeling, where they should be looking, how to follow the story. And there's something about not having that responsibility mm-hmm. at this point in my career that I'm like really into. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. I really enjoy, which is not to say I don't I still love the stage and still enjoy doing that sometimes, but I'm just sort of in love with that right now. Yeah. So. That's that's I've never heard anyone put it that way, which is like, even though because 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 people, of course, talk about how I have control. Like you said, oh, if I'm touching this, you're you're looking on the stage mm-hmm. uh, uh, and I get to control the pace and everything. But 
you're talking about kind of a freedom and a and a and a and a um, and a different kind of control in moment to moment acting yes. in on film. And yeah, that's, that's an interesting right. way of 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 saying like this is just as it's different, but it's just as fulfilling artistically as the fullness you can have on on a stage. Yeah, yeah. And, that's- and For I, now, ask me again in like a couple years. We'll talk about it again. How about we set that? Let's do that. Come back on this show. To. Two years from now, 2021. Mark it. <laughs> Stephanie Kurtzuba. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Back to One is a production of Filmmaker Magazine, which is a publication of IFP, the Independent Filmmaker Project. Listen to back episodes of this podcast at filmmakermagazine.com or wherever you get your podcasts.